I got interested in this disc because there was a lot of media stuff going on about it, uh, because there were big arguments between the archaeologists about whether it was a fake or whether it was real. And that, um, here it is, uh, that's the Nebra Sky Disc. It was found by treasure hunters in the Saxony area, of, uh, in Nebra, um, and they wanted to sell it on the black market, and there was a big thing, and, and the police came in and caught them. And so there was a court case, because in that area you're not allowed to sell things on the black market that you find in the ground. And um, one of the major uh, um, uh, German professors from Berlin said that this must be a fake, because apparently it's a representation of the night sky, and it's nothing like anything that, that, that existed before. It didn't fit into any kind of scheme of things. And so he was quite convinced it was a fake. He even said that the holes that had been punched around the outside had been done, it's obvious that they were done with a drill and that they couldn't possibly have been made in any other way. Uh, but unfortunately, other uh, archaeologists specialised in chemistry actually um, were saying that this, uh, they could analyse the transformation of the, um, the bronze over the years and that the crystal structure showed quite clearly that it dated to 1600 BC. So there was a kind of uh, a, a problem and in the actual court case, you see the man who was being prosecuted for selling it said, well, if it's a fake, then I'm not guilty of anything. So they, the court case was deciding, really, whether it was a fake or not a fake, uh, so that we, they should know whether this guy should go to prison or not. And in fact, he actually stood up in court and said, Listen, I'm sick of all this. It's not a fake, I found it. So he was actually pleading to go to prison and be fine. <laughs> but in the end, anyway, it was decided quite clear that it was a not, not a fake. The scientific an analysis um, uh, won the day over the, the sort of idea that it couldn't possibly have, have been created at that time. And, and, uh, but there are still people who believe it's a fake, even though it's in the museum at Halle, and it's um, got a beautiful sort of glass case, and you can walk all around it and see it. Uh, but still some uh, people believe it's, it's a fake because it's so out of context. Um, so that's what got me really interested in it. And, of course, the fact that it's a representation, the oldest representation known, of the sky. It's older than the official date given for the um, oldest sky representations in Egypt, 1600 BC. Its diameter is 32 centimeters, which is one Persian foot, right? <laughs> um, and its composition is bronze and gold. This is the um, microscope photograph of the disc, and it's the size of the crystals. The bronze crystallizes over time, and it's the size of these crystals that made it quite clear that it had taken, well, three, how many? Uh, 3,600, 3,700 years for these crystals to form. This couldn't possibly have happened over a short space of time. So, this is a, an anomaly, really. Now, where does it come from? It was found in Nebra here, so uh, what would used to be East Germany. And it's almost at the latitude of Stonehenge, just a slightly further north than the latitude of Stonehenge. We'll see this is important. And what's interesting is the bronze, uh, well, the gold comes from Cornwall, and the tin that was used to make the bronze comes from Cornwall as well. But the copper comes from this mine in Austria. Okay, you see that down here? The copper comes from here, and the gold from here. 
So this was a kind of, this is one of the first European <laughs> constructions, you know, this is a, a, a big thing, the material coming from all over Europe. I put Karnak in, in case I forget where I am. Okay, so that's the latitude, 51.28 degrees, uh, slightly north of Stonehenge. And I'm talking about the latitude of the disk uh, because um, on the sides of the disk are two copper, uh, two gold arcs there, here. Now one of them's disappeared. This one on this side has gone, but this one is still here. And <clears throat> these, these copper bands uh, were seen uh, immediately to be uh, an indication of the solstice angles at that latitude. So that's something that's officially recognized. It's a, um, if you take the center of the disk, if you draw the, the two lines from those extremities and you get a central point, then that corresponds to an angle, 41 degrees on either side of the central line, and that's the angle corresponding to um, solstice angles at that latitude. It's a bit like the, uh, um, the, the breast, breastplate from the bush barrow at Stonehenge, it's, which gives the angles of the solstice. Um, but the angle is slightly greater, 41 degrees. Now, um, so that's quite uh, an interesting fact. But what's interesting is that angle corresponds to a specific geometry. Um, you can turn those angles into a rectangle, which is seven by eight, seven high, seven squares high by eight squares wide here. Um, and a lot of my work has shown that these, these latitudes were expressed not in angles as we express them, but in relationships uh, like that, you know, tangents. And if you do the calculation, the tangent of seven over eight is 41.19 degrees. <clears throat> now that's very interesting because it actually measures, that rectangle on the disk actually measures, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 24 centimeters by 21 centimeters. <clears throat> and, and that's dividable by seven and eight in centimeters. Well, if you think about that, centimeters in 1600 BC, um, 24 centimeters is 9.44 inches, was exactly one quarter, uh, one, it's three quarters of a Persian foot. That's for John here. <laughs> okay, um, but it's very interesting to see that these measurements in centimeters uh, actually are dividable by seven and by eight. Uh, if we work out the exact diameter from those figures, we get a diameter of 31.89 centimeters. That would give a diameter of 31.89 centimeters. And I'll be coming back to that, so try and memorize that figure, 31.89. <laughs> it's, it's given us 32. I haven't been able to find very, very precise measurements of this disc. Um, the Bush Barrow um, losange, uh, the Bush Barrow, what's it called? breastplate has been very, very precisely measured, but I've not find, found very precise measures for the disc. It's given us 32 centimeters, which is, for me, probably an approximation. Um, so someday, maybe, I'll be able to get exact measurements of it. Um, but what's interesting as well, and I'll be coming back to this, is that these bronze arcs, which mark the solstices, have holes, one to nine. There's nine spaces made up um, by the positioning of holes which are around the disk. I'll be coming back to these holes, nobody ever talks about them. Um, but, so the solstice 
from, say, summer solstice to winter solstice, this is divided into nine parts, and because that's approximately 180 days, half a year, divided by nine, that's 20 days. So we have a kind of symbolic division of the year cycle into 20-day periods. I'll be coming back to that, that's very important. Uh, I've just put here, for those who know in Karnak, the Krukuno rectangle, which is the sort of reference of solstice rectangles. It's three by four, uh, or six by eight, so that's Karnak. And so at the latitude of Nebra and Stonehenge, where well, we add a square, basically. We go from six by eight to seven by eight. Uh, this is a parkwa. Uh, um, it's a representation, Chinese representation. Uh, I'm just showing this very briefly to show you that the Chinese, or remind you that the Chinese, when they position things, put the south at the top. We're used to putting the north at the top when we do things, whereas the Chinese are looking towards the sun, towards the southern sky, the manifested world, and so they position, orientate things towards the south. And that's what's been said about the Nebra Sky Disk, is that we're looking south here. This is quite obvious. I mean, everybody can see here fairly clearly a sun and a moon. Uh, the crescent moon, of course, and the sun. Uh, and these two objects go to the southern sky. You'll never see the sun and the moon due north. Well, unless you go to the... North Pole, <laughs> but at, at, at the latitude of Nebra, you won't see them due, due north. So we're looking towards the southern sky. So let's look into that a little. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the organization of this. Uh, if we cut the disk like this into four quarters, see how it's organized, we can orientate that so north, south, east, west. We'll discover that the, the north point actually is on a hull, whereas the south point isn't quite. Okay, and I'll be coming back to that. First of all, let's trace the, the crescent moon. Um, if that crescent moon is extended, then that gives us a circle and we see that that circle goes right through the center of the disk. Okay, so that moon hasn't been placed there any old how. It's exactly, uh, its circle goes through the center. And then if we take the inner part of this lower uh, arc, arc here, there's a golden arc here. Um, I'll be coming back to that again. If we take the inner circle, that also goes through the center. So that enables us to get a center point. So we're looking now towards the southern sky, and what also was immediately recognized is this group of seven dots, which are clearly identified as Pleiades. The Pleiad in French, Pleiades, that's how it's pronounced, isn't it? Um, the seven sisters, they're called. And this representation is also the southern sky. Pleiades is very close to the constellation of Taurus, uh, which we see in the southern sky. Very recognizable. Uh, be, here they are, the open star cluster of Pleiades. <clears throat> and the central star is called Maya. And that's very interesting. I'll be looking into this now. Here you can see on a, an astral map star map, uh, the position of Pleiades with respect to the constellation of Taurus. And here you can see it in the Lascaux Caves. This is work done by Chantal jacques Volkiviez, who I've invited to come and talk twice in Karnak, um, who's done incredible work about the astronomical orientation of the Lascaux Caves. And um, she's quite convinced that these paintings are representations of the night sky. And here you can see how the Taurus, the, the, the drawing of Taurus, the painting of, of the bull here, 
with the stars on its horns, and this is the eye of Taurus, Aldebaran. And here you have these little dots here behind the Taurus's neck, the bull's neck, which could quite clearly represent Pleiades. Now, and here, uh, more of her work. This is um, the Vallée des Merveilles in the south of France, um, in the Southern Alps, Mont Bego, and here again, a group of uh, stars that look very much like Pleiades. But we find representations all over the world of Pleiades, of course. Um, here I'm going, going to show these are Sumeria. Okay, so here you see always the groups of the seven stars on all these representations. And then more here, here. And this one in particular is very interesting because if I superpose the, um, the Nebra Sky disk on top of that, look how that fits. Okay, so that's virtually exactly the same graphical representation of Pleiades on a Sumerian uh, engraving and on the Nebra Sky disk. Okay. So the chances of that happening by chance are very slight. Um, and Maya is seen to be the central star. Now Maya uh, was the, the mother of Hermes, and she was the oldest of the Pleiades, who were all sisters, seven beautiful sisters known as Pleiades. And um, the fifth month of the year uh, was named May in her honor. May from Maya. Now this is going to become very interesting when we discover what was happening in May 16, oh, 1600 BC at the latitude of Nebra. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that the first of May was always a feast day. It's 40 days after spring equinox. It's called Beltane or Beltan in Celtic. And it's the feast day for unmarried young women. They have processions with the Queen of May. And hence the word in English, maid. And in French, mademoiselle. In German, mädchen. These are all words coming from uh, Maya, or the month of May. Uh, it's very interesting because now we know that the Pleiades are young stars. They've just been born. It's a kind of nursery of, of stars. And so, somehow, the ancients associated uh, this, um, these stars with the idea of vaginal energy. But it's not only in Europe. The, here, the Maori, the Maori, which is the same sign of word as Maya, Maya, and um, their year starts uh, at the end of May when the Pleiades return to visibility, the helical rising of Pleiades. And here we have the helical rising of Pleiades on May the 1st, 1602, at the latitude of Nebra. What we see is that, in fact, in 1602, at that latitude, the Pleiades reappeared after being hidden by the sun on the 1st of May. So that's very interesting, <laughs> because that's associating this, um, this disk with the 1st of May and as an astrono astronomical uh, fact. It's interesting as well that where the disc was found, I haven't put this in the talk, but I'll say it, where the disc was found on the hilltop, uh, its flat plain around it towards the west for visibility, and there's one hill uh, on the plain, there's one hill, and the sun sets into that hill on May the 1st. So let's look at what's happening on the disk 40 days either side of equinoxes. Okay? 
So we've seen that these holes may represent 20-day uh, periods because it's this, the half year divided by nine. And so if from the center of the disk we pull out there, we'll see that the, the days representing 40 days either side of equinoxes are marked here. One, two. Now there's one here which is actually underneath the uh, arch. Okay, so it's, been, it's under there but it's been kept underneath. So the rising and setting on the 1st of May of the Sun seems to be marked in three of the four axes seen from the center. Something happening there? Yeah. I'm showing you now the sun rises and sunsets every day from solstice. Here you go. This is, what would, this is what happens, right? Sunrises and sunsets. They're shown around those two arcs from the center. Nine spaces of 20 days, making 180 days. That's what I was saying. Now, of course, some of you may know that the 20-day calendar was used by the Mayans. The Mayan civilization, isn't that strange? <laughs> they have the same name as Maya. And uh, it's called the Vigesimal System. Um, and uh, Jeff Stray's talked a lot about the Mayan calendar. He's done a lot of work on that. Um, but another thing that I found very interesting is that in English, we have the word score, which means 20. You know, in the Bible, three score and 10, 70 years. So score means 20, but it also means to mark like in football, <laughs> to score, but it means to mark, to score something, scour, to score. Uh, and so we get this idea <laughs> that 20 was something that you would mark out, 20 days, 20 is linked to marking things out. We get the 20 system in French as well, because instead of saying 80, they say four times 20, 80, uh, for those who know French. Uh, so the 20-based system can still be found uh, in Europe. Um, just show you the dates then that these holes would correspond to, the date periods going from the 21st of June up to the 21st of December. Um, I'm doing all this on the left-hand side here. Now, this looks rather complicated. I went into the geometry of the organization of the disk because there are, there's another interesting fact here is this thing here on the kind of just underneath the central line in black. You can see that there are two, two disks, one above the other. One's in gold and the other one is... Um, uh, it's, it's the, the, its position is marked, but there's no inlay on it. And the official explanation for this is that when they put the gold, gold arc on this side, when they added it on, they suddenly realized that this disc would be slightly underneath it, so they moved it out a bit. But of course, here we have one which is totally underneath it, which kind of destroys the first argument, okay? And I think quite clearly that there's some meaning here. And I, I would imagine we're talking about equinox line. This is equinox. And so we're indicating here something to do with the sun and the moon, like the full moon or the new moon, the sup the, 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 where they... Put, they're over each other at equinox, the very important time of the year. But um, what I'm going to look at, here they are, look. So if we draw, like I did earlier, the circle that includes the moon, because this moon crescent is not a very fine crescent, it's got a certain size to it. In fact, it's one quarter of the moon's diameter. So if I take this width of it, that is one quarter of the diameter. 
which enables us to, set, to know exactly where it is in the heavens. Because the, according to where the moon is, it's lit up more or less. When it's very close to the sun, you get a very fine crescent. Um, when it's halfway around, you get half the moon. And this, so this is a quarter of the way between new moon and full moon. Okay, so 45 degrees from the sun. But if we look at the measurements here, um, the actual moon circle has a diameter of 13 centimetres. Now, isn't that interesting? <laughs> because often the moon is associated to the number 13, and it measures 13 centimetres. Uh, so its width here is 3.25 centimetres, leaving nine, nine and three quarters. Okay, so it's 45 degrees from the sun. Now, 45 degrees from the Sun is the position of the maximum elongation of Venus. Venus can never get further, 46 degrees in fact, Venus can never get further than 46 degrees away from the Sun. Sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the evening. We'll be coming back to that, but it's never further than 46 degrees away because it's a, it goes round the Sun uh, and so it's it can't get further away than its orbit, yeah? so it's never further than 46 degrees. Here's a photo of Moon and Venus on the 19th of April, 1988. Um, and I'll be coming back to that if I have time. <laughs> and of course, Venus in respect to the crescent moon is a very well-known thing. We find it on a lot of flags, sometimes five solar stars, sometimes eight. Um, the moon f at this phase can be traced during, using a 3-4-5 triangle. This is very interesting. <laughs> um, I'll show you how it's done. If you draw the diameter of the moon between the two extremities of this, that's your 13 centimeters, then if you draw a 3-4-5, so this is 13, 9.75, and 16.25. This gives you the points of the inner circle of the moon, right? The, the bit that's, so the actual phase that can be exactly drawn using a three, four, five triangle, which is interesting geometry. Now, immediately when this disk was found, uh, the question was, what is this arc, this golden arc at the bottom? Well, it's at the bottom if we look at it this way. And because it's an arc shape, then it was seen as a solar boat. In Egypt, there's a, a, you know, a whole thing about the sun being in a boat, and it goes from one side. It changes boats at midnight. It's taken from one boat to the other, and midnight goes up to midday, etc. So it's, the idea, in fact, is that the sun does not have its own movement. It has to be in something which is going to get it to move. Uh, it's the same for the Celts. You know? The Celts had the sun on a horse. This is very interesting because it kind of indicates that they knew that the sun was immobile. In other words, in the center of the, <laughs> the solar system. Uh, and it needed something to get it to move. Anyway, so this was seen as a solar boat, and why not, you know, it, it could be. But there was a, a, a film, a TV documentary made by the BBC about the Nebra Sky Disc, and the whole thing virtually was about this solar boat. There was a whole load of stuff about the, the, the symbolism of the solar boat and all this. Um, why not? But the thing is, if you turn the disc round, it's not a boat at all anymore, it's a vault. Okay, a heavenly vault in the night sky, in the northern sky. Because the whole advantage of a circle is you can turn it. <laughs> right? You can turn it round and you can see the, you can see the south sky, sky or the northern sky. Now, you can see that this, um, this arc shape is not symmetrical with respect to the uh, axes. So if I draw a line here between the top of the two solstice arcs here, you see it goes through this one and just 
lines under this one. So the axis of this arc is not, you know, symmetrical with respect to the disc. That's very interesting. Look at this. This is a drawing of Nut, the, or Nu, or Nut, the Egyptian goddess of the sky. And if we look at, she's being held up here. This is the, the Vut Celeste, the, the, the heavenly vault. Sorry, saying this in French. And she's being, being held up at two exact positions by the top of the fingers, which are not horizontal. They're slightly sloping in the same direction. We can see that the perpendicular to that actually perfectly follows the hair here. Okay, it's exactly the angle of the hair on this figure and comes down to the center of the feet here. So if I open this up, I've done it from that particular point, you can see it's sloping over in the same way as it does on the Nebra sky disk. Well, what I found very, very interesting about this golden um, arch is the relationship between the bit that's been shown and the bit that is missing. Because it's a bit of a circle, right? It's part of a circle. So if we take the angle from the center, you get 137.5 degrees, which means that the bit that's missing is an arc of 225 degrees. Can you see that? Shall I hide here? <laughs> is that okay? There's, a, there's, there's the visible bit and the missing bit. Now, some of you may have recognized these figures. 360 divided minus 135 gives us 225. That's what we've just seen. But if we divide 222.5 two, two, two by 137.5, we get 1.618, which is the golden ratio, the divine proportion. So this is in gold, right? This arc is made of gold. And it's the golden ratio of the circle between the hidden bit and the visible side. That is very, very powerful information. And again, if you take the whole of the circle, 360, you divide by 137.5, you get 2.618, which is the golden ratio squared. So that's very interesting. <laughs> and um, a lot could be said about that. I've done the geometry for those of you that are interested because the angle can be done also by trigonometry here with the distances, 13 centimeters. These measurements again, you see, the distance, the exact distance between these two limits is 13 centimeters, um, which uh, gives us this calculation here to get the exact angle. So the measurements, the diameter of the disc, as I said, is given as 32, point, uh, 32 centimeters, 12.5 uh, 12, 12 inches, sorry, 12.5 inches. 32 centimeters is exactly one Persian foot. But if we um, want to calculate the circumference of this disc using 32, that gives us 100.53 centimeters. Now I showed you earlier that the rectangle was 24 centimeters by 21 centimeters, the solstice rectangle, and that gave us a diagonal of 31.89. If the diameter was 31.83, we get an exact meter on the circumference. Okay, so that, I'd really like to be able to check up on that. I mean, it'd be so useful, wouldn't it? to measure something, if you want to measure the meter length, then you just turn it once, right? A disc is very useful, you know, that's how things are measured with wheels and, you know, turn it once and you get the meter length. It's much better to put a measurement on the circumference of a circle than in a straight line. And in a straight line, if you lose a bit, then you know have no longer have the measurement. Whereas if you put it around a circle, it's a much better way of, of encoding the measurement. And what's interesting as well, uh, uh, some of you may know that the inch 
equals 2.54 centimetres. <clears throat> and 39 inches is equal to 99.06 uh, centimetres. Now, around the disc here, there are 39 holes. And those holes are not exactly on the outside of the disc, they're slightly inside, which means that the average distance between these holes is one inch. On this disc, the sun itself measures 10 centimetres, the moon measures 13 centimetres, the solstice rectangle 21 by 28, <coughs> a ratio of 7 to 8 in units of 3 centimetres. And this all sounds very, very strange, I suppose, to a, a British public, but I quite clearly think from all the work I've been doing in Karnak and elsewhere and in Egypt that the metre length existed many, many, many years ago. It was probably the most secret measurement that existed. It's linked to the size of the Earth, of course. It's its definition. And I think that Napoleon introduced it as the universal measurement um, for specific reasons. But it existed, it was a very secret measurement, it existed long before that. But of course, I may now sound like a maniac, you know, like an idiot, doesn't matter. Anyway, the moon at its maximum and minimum position seems to have been shown on this disc as well. Uh, I've drawn the, uh, the white lines there, show the maximum positions of the moon over an 18.6 year period. As you can see, the moon goes further north and further south. It's extreme uh, uh, movement between north and south is much bigger, like at Stonehenge. It goes above the solstice positions on either side. And what's interesting <coughs> here, sorry, is that the minimum north, here the north is at the bottom here, the, the exact limits of this arch seem to be marked by that position. And then we have gold dots as well. And they have gold dots here for the minimum positions. Okay, these two minimum positions and maximum positions. There you go, the side of the things. Now, if you push these out to the edge of the disc, then you get, they're on holes, exactly on, they, they, they come to the position of holes. <clears throat> these holes are not exactly spaced exactly in the same way. They've been adapted. I've looked into this quite a lot because, um, yeah, so what I'm saying here is that if you take from north, the major positions are four holes from north and the minor positions are six holes from north. All right. um, so why are there 39 holes? It's very interesting if you look at the official thing, they say there are 39 or 40 holes around the disc. Now there can't be 39 or 40. Right? There has to be either 39 or 40, and in fact there are 39. But seeing as nobody has any idea about why there could be 39 holes around a disc, 40 is a much nicer number divided by 4. You know, you get the... But in fact, no, these holes are not opposite each other, uh, apart from 4. There are 4 holes which are exactly opposite each other, and which are linked to the moon. This one and this one are exactly opposite. And is it this one? No, I'll show it in a minute. All right. Um, so you don't punch 39 holes around a circle by chance. Do you agree with me? Yeah, right. This was, especially when you're doing something like this, this is a very sort of sacred object. <laughs> a lot of work went into this, they went to the gold, <clears throat> they went to get the gold from Cornwall and the, 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 the copper from Austria, you know. I mean, this is a very, very important and powerful object. 
And so you don't put 39 holes around it by chance. So why are there 39 holes around this disc? First of all, let's put it at the top. <coughs> And I'm going to ask the question, how do you put 39 holes around the disc? Because 39 is an odd number, so you can't do it like you're cutting up a pizza and cut across the circumference, the, the diameter, and do a straight line through the centre, because that, that will give you an even number of holes. So you have to do it some other way. Um, what I discovered is that the angle... Oh dear, this has moved over. I'm getting this problem. Uh, well, this isn't going to work very well because my, my thing has moved. But what I discovered is this is a 3-4-5 triangle. This should be at the center here, and it seems to have moved. And what I discovered is that, in fact, you get an exact uh, angle for four holes, which corresponds to the angle of a 3-4-5 triangle. <coughs> <coughs> and if you keep turning round, well, <coughs> sorry, for the first three triangles it works and then it won't work. Sorry, this isn't really working because it's not centered on the disc, something's moved somewhere. Um, so, what I did was, I, this one, this one's okay, this seems to be centered. So, here's the first one, yeah, you can see the hole here and the, the hole here. Right, that's exactly four holes with a three, four, five triangle. And I discovered that if I do one on the other side, yes, that's perfect as well. We're exactly the same position, right in the center of the hole here, with a three, four, five triangle. So you could go round like this, do them opposite. And if I do them opposite, well, this hole is it perfect. But this one isn't. So this hole is the moon hole I showed you, which seems to have been positioned opposite here. But of course, this one isn't perfect because all the holes aren't opposite each other. So uh, these are the holes that are opposite each other, this one and this one, and this one and this one. And so I was wondering about that. Why, why have these holes been, been moved like that? was this adjustment made because of the moon. So if we look at the, the geometry, so here you've got the good picture of it, you see, three holes, uh, four holes, and then another one, four holes, and another one here, four holes. So three triangles work perfectly, but the fourth one doesn't. So let's start on the other side. That works perfectly, then the next triangle perfectly, the next one perfectly, this one perfectly. Although, this is where the guy dug the disc out, and so he, he, you know, destroyed this bit with his pickaxe as he was getting it out the ground. This wasn't done in, you know, proper conditions. And so, right round to here, this three, four, five triangle being placed, traced around like that, gives perfect results. Um, right round to this one as well, this is good. And then we have three spaces which seem to have been adjusted. So nine segments of four spaces, 36 spaces, plus three spaces, 39 holes. So that seems how it was traced. <coughs> if you want to do the intermediate holes, then you can use a triple square, as you can see on this diagram. Uh, this works because... Um, if you divide a circle into 39, that gives you an angle of 9.23 degrees. If you multiply that by 2, that gives you 18.46. This is the exact, well, this is the angle of a triple square with an error of 0 0.025 degrees. So this is the best way to trace um, 39 holes around a circle is using a 3-4-5 triangle and a triple square. Those who were here yesterday at my talk will realize that those things were used at Karnak. Okay. Now, <clears throat> why are there 39 holes? So, um, one of the reasons is that the planet Mars really fits very well into this cycle. Mars has a cycle, a synodic cycle, of 780 days. 
that is 39 times 20. What does that mean, the synodic cycle? It means that when Mars is at due south at midnight, uh, solar midnight, all right? In other words, when the sun is due north and Mars is due south, uh, that's when Mars is in opposition to the sun. Well, it'll come back to that position 780 days later. Okay? It takes 780 days for Mars to do a whole cycle with respect uh, uh, to the Sun. Okay? That could be done via conjunction. When Mars is in conjunction with the Sun, then it takes 780 days to come back to its conjunction with the Sun. Uh, but it's easier to do it with opposition because you're not looking straight at the Sun. And you can't see Mars when it's behind the Sun anyway. So it's much easier to do it through opposition. Anyways, the important point is that the, the, um, the Mars synodic cycle, you can see, is 779.965 days. In other words, virtually exactly 780 days. That's 39 times 20 days. Right? So we saw earlier that the 20-day thing seemed to be used by dividing this between the solstices, 180 days, nine spaces, that's nine 20 times 20 days. Now we discover that 39 times 20 days, in other words, one time round the disk, corresponds to the Mars cycle. Here are the positions of the oppositions of Mars, you know, that's just uh, 780 days, these are the figures. Okay, we won't hang around on that, I haven't got much time. <laughs> um, what's this showing? This is showing an opposition date, the 28th of August 2003. This is a Mars opposition, Mars due south at midnight. It says two o'clock in the morning, but this was French time, two hours ahead of, right, so that's a Mars opposition. Um, <clears throat> Now, let's look at this on the Nebra calendar. Can we imagine that this Nebra sky disk was a calendar where you would put a peg in the hole and move it every 20 days to see what Mars was doing, see where it was. So if you place the sun at the north, as we were suggesting, and we put Mars in opposition. Now, it can't be exactly opposite because there's no hole it's opposite, so I put it here. And then I put the calendar on the right, and so we can see it moving here. Every 20 days, it's moving. So you've got the dates in 2006 coming round, and then up, conjunction with the sun, and then another, right, going 20 days further, and then it comes back to its initial position 780 days later. So you could track Mars, the position of Mars, if you picked it up at its exact opposition, then you could track, if you moved a pin every 20 days, you could move it round and see what Mars was doing. Um, and for those of you who like astrology, this was found in Germany, and we know that Germany is linked to Mars. Hmm? Right, anyway. Now, the 20-day Mayan calendar uh, is very interesting. So the 20-day 20 names, names in the Mayan calendar are called the Wienal, um, the Mayan month. They also have a trekina, which is a 13-day period. And these two together make the sacred year, the Tzolkin, of 260 days. It's a combination of these two cycles. Uh, three Tzolkins. Tzolkin is the major sacred cycle for the Mayan. Three of those cycles is 780 days, which is the Mars cycle. It seems fairly clear that the Mayans were also following Mars with a 20-day cycle. Um, so you could divide the disk into three, and each part of that disk would be a Tzolkin, a Maya Tzolkin, or six, which are half a Maya Tzolkin. Now Venus, let's have a look at Venus, because Mars and Venus, often we like to, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, we like to know what's going on in the relationship between Mars and Venus, might be important. Um, what does Venus do? Now, Venus, as we were saying, goes around the Sun, and so it's an inner planet. When you're looking towards it, it, it goes one way, then it goes back the other way. 
it goes behind the sun at one point and then comes in front of the sun at another point. Uh, sometimes it has a transit where it goes right in front of the sun and you can see it, that's fairly rare. <clears throat> so it flips from one side to the other. So when it's on one side it's visible in the evening, in the night sky, when the sun sets you see Venus appear in the evening sky and sometimes it's visible in the morning before the sunrise you can see it in the eastern sky before the sun comes up then Venus is there shining in the eastern sky um, its total cycle seen from Earth lasts 584 days uh, there you go it went round the wrong way doesn't matter 584 days now 39 times 15 is 585 days. So if we move a Venus peg one hole every 15 days, 15 days is, is a known length of time as well. And in French they say une quinzaine, 15 days. Instead of a fortnight, fortnight is 14 nights, but French say quinzaine, 15. Right? And in Welsh as well there is an actual name for a period of 15 days. That's in the book. Um, but so the Venus cycle, if we move a peg every 15 days, then uh, we could follow the Venus cycle as well. But when it's close to its superior conjunction, superior is when it passes behind the sun, it's like its movement goes in the same way as all the other planets, Mars and, and Jupiter, the uh, Saturn, they go in the same direction, Mars is going along that way, but when it comes in front of the Sun it's moving in the other direction, it's called retrograde. And uh, sometimes, like in June 2012, don't know if any of you watched that, I've got a video of it here but I haven't got time to show it, the Venus actually goes in front of the Sun, you can see it on YouTube, um, and that happens very rarely, uh, every hundred and something years. Um, and so to go from its extreme position, its extreme evening position, to its morning position, that takes an average of 141 days. That's its retrograde movement. That's 141 days. Now the sun in the sky, if we look at the backdrop of the stars, the sun is moving along the stars in one direction and Venus is moving in the other direction. And so Venus goes pretty fast, like two cars which are going in opposite directions, their relative speed is fast, okay? So Venus goes in one direction for, in 141 days, and when it goes from its morning position to its evening position, the other way around, that takes a lot longer because the sun is going away from it and it has to catch up and overtake the sun and get back to its other position. That takes 443 days. The total of that, 141 and 443, is 540 days. That's the Venus cycle. When I was doing this work, I discovered something quite incredible, which I'm going to tell the general public for the first time, is that if you divide those two numbers, you get pi. <laughs> All right? Take that in. 443 divided by 141 equals 3.1418. Very close approximation of pi. So that's Venus doing that, right? But this has got nothing to do with the subject. I just thought I'd put that in. <laughs> um, well, I thought you might like it. You know, some people might, yeah. Uh, but let's get back to, the, to what Venus is doing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plot Mars and Venus, uh, Mars and Venus on the disk. We're going to start from a Mars-Venus-Sun conjunction, and we're going to see how this can work, moving them around the disk. OK, so by moving, like I said, a Venus marker every 15 days, and with the Sun, so Mars is every 20 days. So if we take a 60-day period, then you'll have to move Venus by four holes, and Mars by three holes, right? Three times 20, 60, four times 15, 60. Okay? Now, what I'm showing you here is what happens. Uh, this is a Venus-Mars-Sun conjunction that took place in 1987 on the 24th of August. 
and here you have Venus, Mars, and the Sun. You also have the Moon here, right? <laughs> uh, but we're not going to look at that. Venus, Mars, and the Sun here. And then the next day is down here, right? Mars, the Sun has moved a bit this way. Mars is lagging a bit behind. And Venus has moved a bit this way. And then Mars seems to be moving this way and Venus this way. Can you see that? Uh, because they're, they're, they're in conjunction, then they seem to be moving in different directions. Uh, and so what I discovered was that there's an easy way of doing this on the Nebra Sky Disk using these arcs. So what you do at first is you move them away from each other because physically, if you watch, Mars and Venus are moving away from each other. Okay? So we'll put the Sun due north at midnight and Mars, this is this conjunction with Mars, Venus and the Sun uh, all in conjunction here on the 21st of August. And then I'm going to move the Mars thing to the right, one square, and Venus to the left. That's what they actually do in the sky. The Sun is in the middle and Mars is on one side and Venus on the other. And so every 15 days I'm going to be moving Venus in one direction and Mars in the other. And we'll come to a 60 day period, it's much easier. Three holes for Mars, four holes for Venus. So we keep going. This is 120 days since the conjunction. 180 days, and then we get to this point, 225 days since the conjunction. Now, 225 is the closest number dividable by 5, which is half of 443. Remember, 443 was the number of days that Venus takes to get from one side of the Sun to the other. And, and because we started with a conjunction, well, it, to get to its extreme position, it takes 222 uh, 221.5 days, okay? And so here, when this Venus peg is here, it's at its extreme uh, position with respect to the Sun. Uh, this is 225 days later. Um, this was on the 2nd of April, 1988, and it corresponded to a conjunction between the Moon and Pleiades, 46 degrees from the Sun. That's interesting because that's what's expressed on the Nebra Sky Disk. Eh? We're on the Nebra Sky Disk, we have a, a Sun, uh, the, the Moon, which is 45 degrees, remember, it's, it's, its crescent shape shows it's exactly 45 degrees from the Sun, um, and you have the Pleiades just by it, okay? Um, so now the retrograde Venus uh, movement of Venus comes to its end. And so now to get back to the next uh, conjunction, it's only going to take 71 days because it's, it's, it's now the Sun's going in one direction and Venus in the other. So it's going to take a lot less time, 71 days. And we can see that to get to the, this south position, it hasn't got far to go, okay? So here's the, uh, the Venus uh, elongation. You can see it here, 45.55 degrees, 46 degrees virtually at its perfect elongation at this, this time, 46 degrees from the sun. There we go. This is 220 days after the conjunction between sun and Venus. This bit's a bit complicated. <laughs> I don't know if you found it complicated up to now, but what happens here, you see, is that um, we could keep going in the wrong direction with Venus, but in fact, it's as if the Venus now goes back in the other direction. Okay, it's now going to go back in the other direction. But in fact, to get back to its conjunction, it only has to do this bit. So, what we could do is put it back up at the top. In other words, we use this arch here and put it back at the hole at the top here and then move it back in the other direction. And that would give us the exact, if we were moving it one hole every 15 days, it would give us exact movement to its other extreme position here. Okay? And then we could move it back down to this hole at the other end of the arch and then move it back around this way. And that way, these two arches will be perfect 
systems to indicate the double speed movement of Venus. That may be a bit complicated, yeah? But it's, it's all right to just keep going, right? If you, if you have a Nebra sky disk at home and you want to be following, <laughs> I'm planning to make some, and you want to be following the position of Venus, well, what you can do is just keep going, uh, and, and you, it'll all work out fine. It's just that one, well, we'll see what happens, because if we keep going, uh, well, one hole later, we come to the Venus-Moon conjunction we saw earlier, okay? Um, but if we keep going here, um, we come to a spot here where Venus and Mars seem to be in conjunction. But they're not in conjunction because Venus never actually gets further than 45 degrees away from the Sun. So if we'd put Venus back up here, and then done our whole movement in the other direction, we would have had an opposition, right? Which is what it was. Whereas here it shows a conjunction. That, that, that wouldn't work, okay? Anyway, let's keep going, just for the sake of things, 60, 60. And then we get 600 days since the conjunction. Uh, we've gone a bit far. But this is a Venus cycle, 584 days. It's gone all the way around. And Mars is, is here, okay? Mars has got about three quarters of the way round because it's a 15 to 20 relationship. And we keep going. And there's a conjunction. Oh, sorry, I went a bit fast there. Here there's a conjunction. Now, this is a real conjunction because they're in the quadrant, the 45 degree quadrant. So here we have a Mars Venus conjunction in the right quadrant, 680 days later, 12th of July 1989. And here it is. 12th of July, 1989, Venus and Mars, just near the star Regulus of Leo. Mm. So this works. <laughs> um, 1st of October, 1989. Uh, so anyway, if we keep going, um, this leads us to realize that there can be a great Mars-Venus sun cycle, which is 20 times Venus going round or 15 times Mars going round, which lasts 11,690 days. In this, this becomes 32.00616 uh, years. 32 years and two days. So we have a, this this um, long Venus-Sun-Mars cycle of 32 years. Uh, the conjunction dates, for example, is the 3rd of April 1949, the 5th of April 1981, and the 6th of April 2013. That, that evening I did a talk on this subject, which was quite fun for the audience. Anyway, it's not the case now. <laughs> um, here we have the different positions, the conjunctions in question. Okay. Now, Mercury, the Mercury triad calendar. Mercury has a synodic cycle of 116 days, which is three times 39 minus one. So, Mercury fits into the 39 thing if you just have a one day adjustment per cycle. So, you'd have to move Mercury one hole every three days. If you wanted to follow Mercury's path, when one hole every three days, and you could see where Mercury was going. That's interesting because um, Mercury in Greece was called Hermes Trismegistus or Hermes three times great. Huh? So, you move him three holes. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, we can do the same, I'm going to have to speed up here, I think. We can do the same thing with the Mercury uh, triad calendar. If I come back to the position on the 4th of April 1989 and I add Mercury to this, as an inner planet its peg turns in the same direction, the anti-clockwise direction of Venus. But as you can see, on a 60-day cycle when Venus has done this and Mars has done this, Mercury is down here. Right? Because uh, in 60 days, it goes all the way round in 117, so in 60 days it's done half a, half a way round. Okay. 
And um, here you go. So you can follow these cycles of Mercury as well with this. Now, there's another very interesting cycle, the human gestation cycle of 273 days or 39 weeks. Isn't that interesting? 39 weeks in the human gestation cycle. It's also interesting because one lunar orbit lasts 27.3 days. Ten lunar orbits last 273 days or 39 weeks. So in Europe, uh, pregnancy lasts nine months. In China, pregnancy lasts ten months because they use lunar months, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> and in the Mayan calendar, 273 days, I believe is a hidden thing in the Mayan calendar. I've actually talked to a Mayan priest from uh, Guatemala about this, and he kind of told me it was correct. Um, 273 days is one sulkin of 260 days plus one trachina of 13 days. Okay, so it's a raised 20 to 21 relationship. <laughs> it's 20 times 13 days or 21 times 13 days. A bit like the old relationship between the pound and the sovereign. Remember that? A pound was 20 shillings and the sovereign was 21. Guinea. 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 The guinea. Sorry. Been out of the country too long. The guinea, right. There's a 20 to 21 relationship. And you also find that in measurements. Uh, but anyway... Um, I wanted to show you this. This is um, uh, Vézelay in, uh, in uh, France. It dates from the Crusades. This is where um, the Crusades were... Oh, I have got to stop, have I? Yeah, <laughs> got to move on. Because I, I this was the really most important thing I wanted to say in, in the whole talk. But it doesn't matter, you know. Now, what I wanted to show you here is that if you count these, this is zodiac. You've got a zodiac around here with 24 medallions, uh, one medallion with each zodiac sign and one medallion showing the work being done in the fields at that time. But above, you see you have a central axis here, above Christ's head, here. So the zodiac goes from here to here and then from there down to here with 24 medallions. But you have another three medallions here plus a third of a medallion. There's a third of a medallion squashed in there. Look at that. And it's a stalk. You know, they bring babies. Yeah, you know that? It's psycho pump. It takes souls up and down. And this is fixed in there to show this 27, one third or 273 day cycle the human gestation cycle. So if you want to follow human gestation cycle or the ten moon cycles, then you move your peg around once a week. Once a week, every Monday for example, then you move it round one hole. Okay? Uh, what am I doing here? I'll move on a bit here. Rate of one hole per week, then you get back. There you go. Oh, hang on, I'm moving on a bit fast here. I haven't really got time for that. This is, uh, this, I've finished now with this. Once I published the first edition of my book, somebody sent me a, a, an email with this. This is a thing called the 58-hole game, which has been found all over the Middle East from antiquity. So you can see things from Egypt, uh, these date back to 2000 BC from Mesopotamia, Syria, here, yeah, Mesopotamia, Syria, uh, Egypt, as you can see. And these are kind of plateaus with 58 holes. Now, what's very astounding is that these are internationally known, this is internationally known as the 58 hole game. There are 59 holes on the. <laughs> this is not a joke, right? There are 59 holes on these things, not 58. 
Um, because there's a big hole here, right? You see the big hole? They haven't counted that. So there are 58 little holes and one big hole. 59 holes. And what's astounding is that the organization of these 59 holes is there are 39 around the edge and 20 inside. Look at this. So if you move a peg 10 and then 10, that's 20 days, and then you move your peg on one, well, you've got to think for counting your 20-day cycle to move on around Mars. And if you go all around the side, then you're going from one side to the other. You do the whole 780-day cycle with this. It's called a game, but if you look at the Louvre Museum, the thing about this, it says, well, we never found the rules. <laughs> yeah, don't know how to play it. Okay. But what's interesting is that uh, it's also 59, it's twice 29 and a half, which is the moon cycle. So you can follow the moon around this one. You can, you can move it from a new moon up to another new moon and then back down. You do two moon cycles, 59 holes. Okay, right, well that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>